So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. Today, we're going to be sharing about the Be Informed Partnership, which has the largest repository of B data in the United States. My honored guest is Dr. Natalie Steinhauer. Natalie is the research coordinator for the Be Informed Partnership. She is also a postdoc at the University of Maryland's Department of Entomology. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the Way to Be interview series. Here's Natalie. Hi, so I'm Natalie Steinauer. I'm um, the research coordinator for the Be Informed Partnership. I am uh, located uh, in College Park, in, uh, near, close to University of Maryland, where I am uh, a postdoc uh, in the B lab. Um, and yeah, so I I work in uh, coordinating a lot of the, re the research program here at the Be Informed. Um, so I work a lot with the Lassen Management Survey, but also the Sentinel Apiary program, and I uh, help with the tech team data analyzers trying to get data out there for the beekeepers to be able to, um, to have access to all of our insights. Okay, that's great. So it sounds like you stay very busy. I want to thank you for joining me for this uh, interview with experts. And I think it's very important for our beekeepers, backyard beekeepers, that's my primary audience. And I want them to be aware of what the Bee Informed Partnership is and why they should participate in the annual survey. What what are the timeframes for the survey? Is it one beginning in April? Yes. So the loss and management survey is uh, an annual effort. So every year in April, and so this year again, it's going to be April 1st to April 30th. The survey is open. Um, so beekeepers can access it by going to our website at beinformed.org. And mm -hmm. that will be the front page, you know, uh, up front and center where people will be able to say, uh, take the survey now and click the link to, to be forwarded to the first page of the survey. So mm -hmm. as I said, it's an annual annual effort. We have been doing this since um, over 10 years. We started in 2011. Um, and, uh, and it's really, uh, this effort is to try to document the turnover rate of colonies in the United States. We try to you know, it's really akin, we call it loss rate, but it's really akin to a mortality rate for colonies. It's trying to understand what is the percentage of colonies that needs to be replaced in a, in a, full, in a full calendar year. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, we use it as a barometer of bee health. It's really, um, I usually, you know, kind of compare it to keeping the pulse on colony health, trying to find long-term trends and in, in seeing, um, you know, in which groups of beekeepers, in which geographic regions are losses, um, uh, and how they vary, and um, really trying to see what is what should be considered a normal loss rate, and where are places and groups that have higher loss rates than expected, and trying to really understand what's driving those. Mm -hmm. And you are a beekeeper yourself. Yes, I am. So I, um, I as you can see, I tell by my accent, I'm not originally from the United States. I actually, uh, I'm originated from Belgium, and so I did a, you know, I did studies in biology there. And then I got into beekeeping with my local bee club at, in Brussels. And so when I was looking for a PhD at the time, I really wanted to uh, be able to go into that passion, that new developed passion of mine in, of beekeeping. And so I was very lucky at the time that uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp had just moved from Pennsylvania to Maryland. That was in 2012, so quite a, quite a long time ago now. Uh, and so he was looking to hire uh, his first PhD student. So I was able to join the, the B lab there at University of Maryland. Uh, at the time, Dennis was also the president of the board for the Be Informed Partnership. And so uh, I got to be involved with the survey from, from there on. Um, so I've been working with the Lassen Management Survey data throughout my PhD. I worked on it uh, as, as some chapters of my PhD I was trying to understand the best management practices that were associated with reduced risk of colony loss. And then as a postdoc, I switched over to being now the science coordinator for the Bean Farm Partnership and, and, and managing more of the of the programs that we do there. Um, so yeah, I've been very happy to be able to, to dedicate more of my time to that to that great team. Mm -hmm. And the Bean Inform Partnership, it began in 2007, is that right? So um, so yeah, it's it's been it's, yeah, it was it's been quite a long time that the Bean Inform Partnership has been going. Uh, the survey itself was uh, existed just before the Be Informed Partnership uh, uh, was founded. Mm -hmm. So the, the loss and management survey was originally uh, put together by APRE Inspectors of America. And that was 
the wake of, of the, the worry about CCD and trying to really understand. Uh, we realized at the time that we didn't have a, 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 like an estimate mortality rate of colonies from year to year. Mm -hmm. We have estimate of the population of, of the number of colonies in the country from USDA reports, but we don't have how many percentage of colonies need to be replaced every year. We didn't have that at the time. And so the acre inspectors uh, wanted to kind of like have a, a consistent way of collecting that data from beekeepers so that we could estimate it and keep, you know, estimating that that uh, number through the years to be able to detect any trends. Mm -hmm. And so so um, that's under under that impulse that the Bean for Partnership as a collaboration of uh, you know um, lab throughout the country that focused on honeybee health decided to put that collaboration effort together. Um, so they they started this uh, originally uh, a USDA NIFA grant. So that's the Department of Agriculture National Institute of Food and Agriculture funded the project for the first few years. And at the end of that grant in 2014, we made the jump to become a nonprofit. Okay, so this is a nonprofit organization and it's referenced as a partnership. So who's the partnership between? So really we are very lucky that um, um, we have collaborators throughout the country. Um, so, so a lot of us are associated with University of Maryland, but also um, other universities uh, like Texas A&M, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, um, California, I should have a list. <laughs> uh, actually, you don't need the list because we're going to put a link to the BM4 Partnership website and all of those collaborators are listed there. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky to have collaborators throughout the country. We usually say we are present in all of the, the big commercial beekeeping hubs throughout the country mm -hmm. um, uh, is where we are uh, trying to have a, a physical presence uh, through what we call the, the tech transfer team program. So we have field specialists that are affiliated with each of those universities that are there to work with commercial beekeepers in our tech transfer team program. And, and as I said, we have various programs, right? Where we try to, our, our, our pri primary objective is to try to um, help beekeepers keep healthy bees. That's our mission. Mm -hmm. and so we're trying to do that by um, making it easier for them to monitor their colonies. So with commercial beekeepers, it, um, it, help, uh, it involves having field specialists that can go in the field, meet with the commercial beekeepers, do a lot of inspection themselves because those are, you know, when be commercial beekeepers are at their busiest time. So they don't uh, off, you know, they sometimes want to uh, have help from other people to do that. Also have um, the benefit of having eyes that, you know, go in other, colon in other colonies of other operations throughout the country as well that can put their colonies result into perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we so that's you know work we do that with commercial beekeepers, but in a we try to to bring the same uh, expertise to small scale beekeepers as well through some of our other program. For example, the Sentinel Apiary program is more geared towards smaller scale beekeepers, but also beekeeping clubs and all beekeeping organizations. Um, and that's again trying to uh, make it easier for beekeepers to monitor their colonies um, by giving them all the tools, the trainings and everything that can really help them um, take the, take the, the jump and, and go uh, inspect their colonies and feel more, more confident about that. So can you give us a sense of how many people compose your organization? Uh, do you mean the number of employees or? Uh, the number of people that are in the Be Informed Partnership, like you mentioned that you have the um, field specialists, we could mm -hmm. start with them. Like how many field specialists are there? So I believe at the moment we have eight field specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, we are about, I was going to say, a team or of uh, about 18 people um, that are as affiliated with the informed partnership. So we do have, you know, uh, administrative people. We have IT, um, uh, communication people, and and then uh, our field specialists. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an idea of what a field specialist would do? Like when they show up at a commercial apiary, just walk us through what they might be doing for that uh, apiary owner and what they would be looking for. So I'm going to be, a, I'm going to give a disclaimer right here that um, I am mostly, um, 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 you know, very uh, involved with the loss and management survey. So if you want okay. to more details on the on the tech transfer team. I would recommend you to interview Anne Marie Fauvel, who's our coordinator for the tech transfer team, and I know okay. she talk to you about that. I can give you I can give you a 
a, a shorthand of it. But uh, if you want more detail, then no, that's okay. There's plenty we can still talk about that's more in your wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> because for those that are listening now, they may be wondering uh, why should they even share their information with the Be Informed Partnership. In other words, what's going to be done with the information? We know that their privacy is protected. Uh, how does it benefit the beekeepers to collaborate like this and spend the time filling out a survey and giving details about their own operation and management practices, treatment practices, and things like that? What's the benefit to the beekeeper? Yeah, thank you for asking. So <clears throat> we are uh, talking here about the loss and management survey is probably our longest standing effort. Like we have been doing it, as you said, since 2007, before the Bee Informed Partnership was even launched. Um, so it's a it's a very long term effort that we believe as uh, every every adding year we're adding value to the survey because we are able to detect um, um, more trends and and and, and change in the data. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the we are we you know we're very thankful that to all to all beekeepers, commercial and small scale beekeepers that take the survey because uh, we really need their part participation to be able to rep to show a representative picture of, of what the industry is mm -hmm. uh, and in the past we've been really successful at, at, at um, you know uh, gathering interest and in, and in, in collecting a lot of, of, of responses we have about uh, between you know 3,000 and 5,000 responses every year we estimate uh, using the USDA number that our respondent represents on average one in 10 colonies in the country, which for a, a voluntary survey is pretty amazing. So we're very thankful of all of our respondents. Mm -hmm. um, but so every year, yeah, we, we're trying to, um, to continue this effort. And we think for the beekeepers that participate, uh, they have to really understand that the reason why this, this data is important. It's not, um, uh, it's, yeah, we find it import, in, important and interesting, obviously, as researcher, but uh, we also think it has practical implications for the, for the beekeepers. Uh, various ways. So one of the ways that we like to, uh, that the data is used uh, is um, it, it really drives research in a lot of ways. So whenever we go in, in conference, we like to see uh, um, that, you know, our, our research or data is, is cited by a lot of researchers out there. Um, mm -hmm. I frequently cited the, 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 all of the concerns and all of the, um, uh, you know, in, in one of our questions, for example, which is the cause of, of colony loss that we ask every year to beekeepers, what do you think is the most important cause of colony loss in your operation? That number, for example, is cited by a lot of, of, of researchers that use that to drive their research hypothesis, trying to focus on research topic that really um, come from beekeepers interest and, and, and are highlighted by beekeepers as a concern. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you know, all of the topics that are covered in the Bean Form Partnership from those answers, uh, this is giving researchers areas of where to focus to answer those beekeepers' needs. Um, but uh, so in addition to really helping in developing research questions, um, we also, you know, beekeepers have access to uh, some of that data. So we usually try to hold national estimates and the state estimates published online every year. Uh, in a visual way so that it's really a, a more easily understandable and, and interpretable compared to some other surveys. Uh, so we really think that it's important for us to communicate those results um, as soon as we can. Um, um, and, and again, this, this figure, for example, the colony loss that we, we see every year, so we have this trend figure online, um, uh, is also used to to justify you know, funding in research, to address all of those questions, to really um, keep the, the, the struggles of the beekeepers into public attention and uh, uh, funders' um, attention as well, so that we can continue to try to explore all of those areas of concerns to try to continue to better honey health. Excellent. And so I did look, and uh, just for those who are listening, because a lot of people like to have this broken down in very clear terms, but based on the past surveys, and of course, this year's survey wouldn't show until next year. Is that right? It's usually, uh, we try to have preliminary results of the, the national and state level of loss in a couple of months. So that's usually will come in the summer. And then we take usually a full year uh, to prepare a peer review publication, just because peer review publication takes a lot of time to prepare and submit yeah. and, and get decisions. So the peer reviewed publication usually uh, is published in the, in the following year. But mm -hmm. The, the preliminary results should be available in the summer. 
Okay. And for those that are wondering also, because we have listeners all over the world, uh, this is actually for the United States specifically that we're contributing this information that it's sourcing from those beekeepers. But I thought it was interesting, the number one cause of failure uh, and Northern beekeepers were failing more often than Southern beekeepers as far as their colony loss percentage was. And so number one, number one was Varroa destructor mites. Mm -hmm. Number two was queen problems. Number three was starvation. And number four was weather. And then there were lesser uh, causation issues below that. But uh, the queen problem thing I wanted to ask, are you, are you, could you talk about what's happening to the queens? In other words, are, is it fertility, genetics, queen loss? Or again, is this something that somebody else knows more or? Can you um, so, so this question in particular, this is the question about what do beekeepers consider being the, the most important drivers of colony loss in their operation? Mm -hmm. Ask this question about winter loss and summer loss, and we mm -hmm. have some differences there as well. Mm -hmm. Have observed that commercial beekeepers cite different uh, uh, cause of colony loss than small scale beekeepers. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, yes, we, um, we see that varroa and queen issues are usually cited very high in, in, those, um, in those questions. And queen issues can be multiple, um, uh, can have multiple causes, could be fertility issues, it could be um, uh, replacement issues. Um, so, so the question is too generic to be able to I really identify what the beekeepers um, uh, were identifying, but at least that gives us a clear idea that concerns related to queen health uh, is on the top front of concerns of, of, of beekeepers in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and should be addressed more. So this is really the intention of the survey here is identifying that as an area of concerns of the beekeepers in the United States and therefore an area that needs more research. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that uh, trends have changed looking at your data results through the years. Uh, backyard beekeepers used to not treat and used to not count varroa destructor mites. Uh, early on, we had a lot of natural beekeepers. They were just wanting to let their bees make it or not make it. And that trend has shifted strongly into the category of documenting um, varroa destructor mite occupation levels, percentages of uh, infestation, and also that now most backyard beekeepers are uh, treating or seeking some form of treatment. So we would consider those trends good. Um, would you say that across that time frame, since the beginning of the Be Informed Partnership and people have been reporting to today, uh, with those changes in management, has the Varroa mite problem stayed the same, increased, decreased? What's uh, going on? Yeah, so, so you're citing a very interesting result that came out of the survey. So that was one of the, the um, you know, lesson learned from the survey is how we can really follow um, trends in management practices over the years. So we see the practices that are the most prevalent, that are the most uh, popular among beekeepers and how those have changed over the years. And so one of the most dra drastic uh, changes that we were able to identify was this, this change in the proportion of beekeepers that use monitoring of mites. As you say, you know, if you ask beekeepers like we did in 2011-12, in, uh, in uh, if they were using monitoring, if they use, if they were actually applying treatment for varroa in their colonies, most of them would say no. And now we are at uh, about 80%, I believe, of backyard beekeepers that use a treatment in their colonies and high, frequ uh, high frequency of them monitoring. And um, the, the really good things that we saw was the combination of beekeepers that monitor and treat, because we really believe that that should be uh, practices that go hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. Usually recommend that, you know, treatment should be applied in response to a monitoring. So if you see issues in your colonies um, uh, after monitoring, if you are higher than the level that uh, you estimate is, is problematic, either using the action threshold recommended um, um, you know, by your local, uh, by your local uh, bee club or, or, or other sources. Um, so you made the decision based on your data in your, in your yard. Mm -hmm. You apply the, the, the intervention of your choice, and then you should monitor again to estimate the effectiveness of your intervention. So mm -hmm. all of that is um, um, practice that we, we consider being, you know, this integrated pest management um, that should go hand in hand with also prevention ahead of time, but monitoring treatment and monitoring again, um, all of that should be part of a, of a calendar year of a beekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. And so you were asking if uh, if we see um, results, you know, in, in, in terms of 
do we actually see Varroa laws getting better uh, nationally? Mm -hmm. I would unfortunately no, um, but there is multiple things at hand here. So uh, one thing that researchers have, have um, um, you know, started wondering about is if the same number of mites now are actually more damaging than the, that same number of mites years ago. Because what we see is the, the, the viruses that are associated with Varroa are also changing. As the longest the Varroa is, is in our uh, environment, the, the longest the, 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 the viruses associated with those uh, Varroa um, uh, is changing as well. And so there is, um, um, you know, very interesting research out there that show that, um, um, you know, maybe that's heading too close to home, but in the co comparable, comparably to, to COVID, there are variants of, of, for example, deformed green virus, which is the, the most prevalent virus as a mm -hmm. We have seen variants of the viruses change over the years as well. So, um, you know, I, Maybe older uh, beekeepers that have been keeping bees, um, even maybe before Varro arrived in the United States, remember that at the very beginning, uh, we used to say that 20% infestation um, was our threshold. Then it dropped to 10, then it dropped to 5, then it dropped to 3. Now some beekeepers are always trying to keep Varro infestation below 1%, right? This change in the what is considered the damaging level of Varro mm -hmm. might be the result of a virus change in the background. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, all of that is confounding the 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 the, the risk that Varroa pose on their own. So it's very hard to see, um, um, you know, the the yeah beekeepers are trying to keep better control of the Varroa, but then Varroa themselves might be becoming more damaging as well. So mm. again, it's hard to confound the two. Right, because the virus loads that the varroa destructor might carry are not the same even from varroa to varroa and region by region. That's uh, correct. So I guess I guess another way to ask the question would be, since they've under the backyard beekeepers, what percentage um, of the survey is represented by small scale people with fewer than fifty colonies? So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. So um, we have information to um, to look at the the representativity of 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 all beekeepers compared to what we know about their fraction in the beekeeping industry, right? So we know that um, uh, the beekeeping industry is a very uh, divided world with where most of the colonies are managed by commercial operation, but most mm -hmm. of the beekeepers are small scale beekeepers. And we actually find that dichotomy in the survey as well. So most of our respondents are small scale beekeepers. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but it's something about like 80% of our respondents are small scale beekeepers. But then the, the, the number of colonies, if you look at the number of colonies that are represented in the survey from each of those respondents, again, the majority of the colonies in the survey belong to, the, to that small fraction of commercial beekeepers. So mm -hmm. it's actually very representative of what we know about the uh, industry um, in general. Most of the colonies are commercial. Most of the beekeepers are back then. Right. Okay. So um, if we're not, if we don't see a real strong trend with the road striker mite, which may be changing in its virus load and its effectiveness and damaging the bees, are we seeing a greater colony survival rate after people have implemented best practices? So, so what we can do is we can compare every year the fraction, the respondents that tell us that they have that they are using Varroa management uh, in their operation with the, back, uh, with the beekeepers that tell us they are not using Varroa management in their operation. And when we compare those two groups, year after year, we see the beekeepers that are implementing good management practices for Varroa, so monitoring and treatment, prevention, all of those preferably together are performing better. They are experiencing lower losses. Um, the problem is we do not see an improvement of the general level of loss across the country over the years. So you would think mm -hmm. that because a higher fraction of, of beekeepers um, manage their, their varroa better from year to year, we would see an improvement. Mm -hmm. We do not. And that might just be because varroa is one of the drivers of, of, of issues mm -hmm. of colony health. It is probably and arguably the most important one, but it's not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we see is here that, um, um, you know, there is this um, um, uh, this metaphor, right, in, in evolutionary biology that sometimes we are running to stand still, uh, like in uh, Alice in, 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 in Wonder, and 
in Wonderland. <laughs> Is yeah. that in English? Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so we are probably at the same time, uh, the, 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 in kind of like the same place here where beekeepers we see are, are you know, at least uh, according to, to what the recommendation of experts are, we see beekeepers improving their management practices, but we don't see yet the result in terms of reduced colony mortality. Mm -hmm. If anything, we actually might be pointing toward an increase of, of mortality for the small scale beekeeper in the summer. We have to, we're, we're trying to keep an eye on that because uh, in the last couple of years, we start to see a, a trend in higher summer mortality for backyard beekeepers. So we're keeping mm -hmm. an eye on that. Um, but what we usually see as a result from year to year is uh, there is generally not a worsening of colony mortalities. Um, there are some worse year and there are some slightly better year. Overall, it is still higher than what beekeepers tell us they find acceptable. So usually we, uh, we when we ask beekeepers what they would consider acceptable to lose over a year, mm -hmm. um, they tell us uh, about 20% of loss over the winter would be acceptable. And so um, uh, in the last 10 years, we were about at 30% mortality over the winter and 40% when you look at April to April annual calendar year. So we are higher than what beekeepers consider acceptable. Um, um, and there are fluctuations from year to year. Generally, we don't see a worsening um, with the caveat that I mentioned about maybe a potential for summer increase in backyard beekeeping. Now, how have the key elements of the survey changed, if at all, through the years? Do you <laughs> add categories? Do you remove categories that you found uh, less helpful? So um, over the years, there has been changes to the survey. Um, as, as I was mentioning, the survey is now more than 10 years old, so we've tried to keep up with the, the time. So, um, you know, the survey is now fully online. Um, uh, beekeepers can take it on the phone or on their computer. We try to clarify questions. So a lot of times the improvement that we make from year to year is more mostly not about really completely changing a question, but it's going to be about uh, trying to make it clearer and easier to understand and, and, and not as misunderstandable and, and so we're trying to to really uh, you uh, we actually are relying a lot on on the um the opinions we receive from beekeepers to try to to improve those questions and really the survey is divided as the name is you know the loss and management survey mm -hmm. the is divided into two two sections the loss survey itself is uh we're really trying to keep it very consistent from year to year we have added some flexibility for commercial beekeepers to so that the, the split season was easily um, understandable. And, and it was easier for commercial beekeepers to give us their split numbers uh, because April is right in the middle of their splits, right? So that's a, that was a little tricky for them. So we tried to clarify that and make it a little more flexible for commercial beekeepers. But other than that, that last section has, has really uh, been very, very similar over the years. Hmm. And the management section, we have actually, in the last three years, tried to really um, <clears throat> made a lot of changes to the survey in order to answer again um, one of the, the comments that we received from, from beekeepers. That was that uh, originally our management survey was really attempting to have a, a comprehensive view of management from queen to treatment, to feeding, to seasonal practices, to pollination, all of it being asked every year. And it was a very long survey. So in the last two years, we've actually learned a lot, uh, worked a lot with the, the University of uh, Auburn University, with the B Lab at Auburn University, um, uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Jeff Williams and his team, to restructure the survey so that now every year we focused on one topic and we rotate the topics from year to year. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, we focused on queens and new colonies. In 2022, we focused on everything environment, nutrition, pollination, weather. And then this year in 2023, we're focusing on pests and diseases. So everything from monitoring and intervention. Hmm. Uh, so the idea is to really make it easier for the beekeepers to take the survey. It's going to be shorter. Um, it is still um, what we call a retrospective survey, right? So it means that in April, when, when beekeepers can take the survey, the survey cover, covers last April to this April. That's one calendar year. So Beekeepers that have keeper notes throughout the year, that will definitely help them take uh, insert a survey mm -hmm. um, because you will have to remember what you did over the, the whole year. Okay. So now the way it's set up, 
I didn't notice any category for the type of beehive that uh, beekeepers are using. For example, the standard Langstroth, which is the most common, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of horizontal hives out there. There are some polystyrene insulated hives and things like that. Will there be categories uh, based on the type of hives that the bees are being kept in at all? So that is actually a question that was part of our survey for over um, uh, 10 years that we've asked the management section. Uh, and to be honest, I don't remember the result from the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but we we have asked that sir, that questions in the in the new co colonies and equipment year. So it, this will not be part of the survey this year, but it will be again when we when we go back to that topic. So we, as I said, we don't try we try to not ask all of the same questions every year. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's all super interesting, and it results in is there a best practices guide that beekeepers can access um, on your website, or how does that go? Well, so thank you for asking that. So the we really try to 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 bring back to what our actionable recommendation that beekeepers can employ in their in their operation, and and so um, we try to communicate those to the beekeepers in multiple ways. So we give a lot of presentation. Uh, me and other people from my group, field specialists and others, will give presentation to bee club. So if uh, if someone is interested to to hear about recommended practices from what we learned from the survey, but also our other programs, right? So our Sentinel program, our tech team program, from all the expertise of our field specialists in the field, we, we've gathered all of that in, in, in presentations uh, that we give to the clubs and, 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 and more. Um, we also have a, a publication for the, the most academic of you that wants to read a peer review publication that came from my, my PhD chapter. Uh, that's about the best management practices that resulted from, from the survey. Mm -hmm. um, actually uh, translated that into a blog that is also available on our website that might be easier okay. to digest. Um, so yeah, we're trying to get that data out there. Um, but I have, um, I have um, uh, a maybe a little bit of a disappointing and, and not so shocking um, summary for that is that keeping healthy bees unfortunately takes a lot of time and effort and there is not a lot of uh, silver bullets and one practices that will help beekeepers to get to 0% loss. Mm -hmm. uh, and what usually we see is that improvement in bee health takes time. Um, so for example, there was a, a student that um, um, was part of the bee lab that actually implemented some of those recommendations came, that came from the survey into a field study over the, the course of three years. Mm -hmm. And he found um, um, that the, the, you know, the, the differences between the groups in which the best recommendations were applied compared to the general practice uh, was, you know, those colonies, the, the percentage of, uh, of mortality was improving year after year, but it took three years for it to be significantly different, right? So the, the progress will be little uh, and over time, mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, um, it's, it's going to be a long-term effort to, to keep health, mm -hmm. to yeah, restore health and to keep it going all, over the years. Yeah, and I also noticed on the the reporting that you had, the average um, experience of backyard beekeepers was about five years. Is that right? The experience level with beekeeping? Yeah, so that was the that was the median. So that means that 50% of backyard beekeepers are below five years and 50 other percent are above five mm -hmm. years. That's kind of like in the middle range of experience. Now, I wonder if those that had more years of experience um, were demonstrating lower colony loss. So that's a great question. That was something I was curious myself, and we didn't find a significant difference um, uh, between those two groups. Um, there was um, other, you know, there there are other surveys in, in in the world, and there was a, a survey in Europe where they actually found a, a correlation between the the number of years of experience uh, and and water mortality. We did not see that in the U.S. population. Um, so yeah. Maybe we should retry again in a few years. <laughs> and the most experienced group are the commercial beekeepers. With... So they've been, but... yeah, according to a survey, they've been in the in the business, I was going to say, longer. So yeah, the, the yeah. majority of, of, of commercial beekeepers have, I think it was over 30 years of experience. Yeah, 30 years of experience. Okay. Well, this is all really interesting. Probably a lot for people to wrap their minds around a little bit. I know people, and it's too bad we're we're not really identifying 
very specific, do this and you'll succeed, do that and you'll succeed. Uh, it's a slow trail of implementing uh, improvements in your practices and management of bees as you go through your seasons of beekeeping. Is there um, an overall word of advice you have for people, for beekeepers that are listening or watching? Um, I mean, yes, there is definitely um, a lot of things that that beekeepers can do to to give their their colonies, um, um, you know, better success. And it's all about trying to reduce the stress on your bees, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 if you try to if you give them better nutrition, if you lower the var the, the varroa uh, pressure, all all of those things that you do for for to help reduce the stress on your bees, that means that they're going to be more resilient to those other stressors that they that they have to sustain from the environment. So there's definitely things you can do to help your bees. I think monitoring, all, all everything that you can do for prevention and monitoring uh, of diseases in your yard uh, will pay in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, it's a lot to take in actually. Now this is the largest collection of this kind of information being published in the United States. There's no other survey that's on this level, right? Uh, yeah, not nationally, yes. Not nationally. And uh, what do you see in your future? Are you staying with Bee Informed Partnership? What What does your future look like? Yeah, I mean, we still have a lot of good work that we want to do um, with the team. There, there is more that we want to bring to the beekeepers. We want to um, try to facilitate, um, you know, for beekeepers to keep healthy colonies. We want to facilitate for beekeepers to give us... Um, um, some of their data so that we can we can get more insights out of those mm -hmm. and and we have we have you know very interesting projects that are uh, in in process of being baked right now and we are hoping that we can show those to people mm -hmm. uh, in the near future so I will stick around to be with, uh, with I was I usually say I, I will stick around to my job as long as I keep learning and, and I keep learning so. okay hey I like that so now those that other than contributing and filling out the surveys, how could people support the Be Informed Partnership? Thank you. So, so absolutely go take the survey. It's gonna be live April 1st to April 30th. That's definitely, uh, if you have uh, half an hour, that is probably the, the best thing you can do to support our, our program and, and give your data, be, you know, participate into the, the, the citizen science program. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanna know of other ways that Be Informed can help you keep better bees, uh, or healthier bees, you know, you can look at all the other programs that we have, the Sentinel Apiary program, mm -hmm. Equity program for commercial beekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are trying to run webinars to try to share information with, with beekeepers. Um, we, as we are a nonprofit organization, I would be remiss if I don't say, if you want to donate, we'd be very happy um, mm -hmm. for your support. Um, but just spread the world about, about, uh, about what we do um, and and we are very thankful for all of our collaborators and people that are helping us share the work. And you mentioned the Sentinel Apiary program. That does have a cost associated with it. Is that right? That is correct. So it's a, um, it's a at cost service. So um, we are um, basically providing um, beekeepers. Well, there is a lot of change that are going to come to the Sentinel, which is very exciting. But currently, this, the, the way that the program works is we are um, providing um, beekeepers with everything that they need to sample their colonies um, uh, every month for eight months. And the idea is to cover the whole active season. Um, and, and the idea is to really encourage beekeepers to go into their colonies, do a full inspection. We, we, we're giving them the tools and, and the training so that beekeepers can become more confident about inspecting their own colonies, identifying issues, um, ahead of time, right? It's all about trying to, to catch the earliest sites of issues so that you can intervene early. Um, mm -hmm. So we're trying to teach beekeepers on how to identify brood disease and and and, and keep mm -hmm. note on colony size and documenting that from month to month and, and keeping mm -hmm. track of the health of their colonies. Um, and um, this year we are actually piloting a, a new project with the Sentinel APR program where we're trying to encourage bee clubs to partner with us so that um, uh, we can share with them more of those training uh, documents and, and videos and other forms of, of, of trainings um, to, so, to, to really try to, you know, a lot of bee clubs have uh, introduction to, to, to beekeeping and we wanna kind of give them the, the, the highest level class on how to identify diseases and how to keep monitoring 
for uh, you know after the first couple of years of, of beekeeping, mm -hmm. um, and so so we're working on on that as a pilot here this year. So trying to really understand the needs of of, of beekeepers and and beekeeping organization and how we can help by providing uh, some of those of the materials. Mm -hmm. so what, ideas, reach out. Okay, so what kind of samples would they be sending in? So currently, we are um, uh, using uh, samples to uh, to in, to quantify the load of the varroa, and we also are doing uh, nosema diagnostics um, on those samples. We um, are trying to pa uh, partner with other uh, organizations to see if uh, if we can do on demand based on the, what the beekeepers might be interested in. We can do viral um uh, pesticides we are not doing pesticide in-house but we can uh, send those for the beekeepers uh, to some to some laboratory so that um basically we just we'll just cover the cost of the sample so that we can basically help the beekeepers by sending it to the appropriate uh, laboratories and and can help the beekeepers understand their reports on in, in return mm -hmm. um so those are the things that are currently available and we're trying to see if there is demands for for more and different. Diagnosis. So they're so they're sending in the physical bodies of the bees. Mm -hmm. that... uh, technique currently, um, by, um, technique usually, uh, pesticide informa uh, information is done on either wax samples or pollen mm -hmm. pollen samples. Those are the traditional ma ma matrices for, for okay. pesticide data. And how long has the Sentinel program been going on? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm, I don't remember from the that's, okay. <laughs> that's okay. But that's interesting. So you also, and this is something that ties in with uh, your field group also. Like if a bee club wanted someone to come and give a presentation about the Sentinel um, program, mm -hmm. who would they contact? How would they set that up? Um, so just go to the beeinform.org. Uh, we have a contact form online and say, you know, if you're interested in somebody giving a presentation, uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the Sentinel or any other program, you can use that form and it will reach the appropriate person behind the scene. Do you have funding for those people to travel or is that an expense that the club would pay or would this be like a Zoom presentation or something? So usually when we do presentation, it really depends um, on case by case, right? If there is someone uh, locally uh, that can that can go to a to a to a beekeeping club locally, I have gone to beekeeping clubs uh, where it's not too much to ask for travel, right? So I I, I can I can go uh, without too much issues. Mm -hmm. uh, um, typically, we will ask for a donation in lieu of a of a of a speaking fee uh, just to help support the Beanform Partnership mission. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then, yeah, so if you, it, I, I have to say that since COVID, uh, a lot of us have um, uh, been very successful at giving online presentation. Mm -hmm. That has been really successful and it's cheaper for the beekeeping organizations as well. So that seems to be like a, a winning solution. Mm -hmm. for okay. Well, that's a lot of good information and there will be links to everything down in the video description and in the podcast there will be links down in the description of the podcast as well. So I want to thank everyone for listening and I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Steinhauer, for being here and sharing about the Informed Partnership, the important work that they're doing and how important it is for us as beekeepers to provide our information so we can get a better picture of what's going on in bee management in the United States. And thank you so much, Fred. So, absolutely. Thank you. The yep. Thank you. So that wraps up another interview in the series of interviews with experts. Please take a moment and follow the links in the video description to learn more about the Be Informed Partnership. You'll find a lot of useful information on their website, and I really hope that when the survey begins in April, that more beekeepers will take the time to complete the survey and share your data. I want to thank you for spending your time with me today. I'm Frederick Dunn. And this is The Way to Be.